Uh, oh, yeah. Works. Cool. Uh, my name is Quinn Sim. I'm a director of video platform at Vimeo, and today we'll go over the, as Phil said, the never-ending story of replacing your video pipeline, transcoding pipeline. So first, just some quick context about Vimeo. Um, we were funded in 2004 as a way for college humor to host their videos. Currently, it's a video hosting SaaS company. It's almost only user-generated content. We have tens of millions of uploads per month, and a lot of our service names are named after 80s movies for reasons. First, Tron. This is our legacy transcoding platform. It's the one that's been there since 2013. Might still be there in 2024, hopefully not. Um, what it does is uh, it outputs progressive MP4, so Mux, audio, and video, and it's progressive. The way it works, it, it downloads the old source file locally, transcodes it to the selected rendition, and kind of uploads it to cloud storage. It was designed 2012-ish, when we were in our own data centers, not using anything in the cloud. It was kind of lifted as is to the cloud, doesn't really use any of the features offered by the various cloud providers. The only thing it does is take advantage of spot uh, preemptible instances. Um, what it does currently, it still handles some of the edge cases that the new flow doesn't uh, handle, and we'll go over into details about this. The new one, Filecore, it's a distributed transcoding platform. So what is distributed transcoding? So basically, you take a video, you have a video, and you chunk it, and then you transcode each of those chunks in parallel. In parallel. Then you've got a bunch of transcoded chunk. You can combine together, and then you've got the output video. And so the idea is that it's much faster because you can kind of all those trans transcodes can happen in parallel in instead of being sequential. So goals like why did we make a new transcoding platform? So first is to it to be parallelized, so it's much faster and also distributed. So we are more more resilient to to errors. Uh, we also wanted to take advantage of the much cheaper spot uh, instances. Uh, for no, those not familiar, basically it's like, instead of having a VM that will be there for months to come, it's a VM that might go away at any time. So basically you need to be ready to handle the case where your cloud provider tells you, hey, this is going away in 30 seconds, you know, be ready for it. And the idea with doing this with parallel transcoding with those small chunks is now if the thing goes away, you only lose like a minute of video, of transcoded video instead of losing you know, if you're like two hours in into a, a 24 video, instead of, you know, losing those, you know, you get what I mean. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> one thing uh, as well is that in the cloud, to note, uh, you pay the instance by the second. This is kind of gross generalization, it might depend on your contracts or whatever, but like the general idea is that you pay the instance by the second after like a minute or something like that. So having one instance for an hour or 10 instances for six minutes, will be roughly the same price. So you might as well have 10 instances be done in six minutes, and this way your video is uh, you know, ready faster, and it's about, it's about the same price. Um, those are more like internal goals. Uh, Vimeo has been a monolith historically. We're starting making a video API, and we wanted to kind of start moving everything video related to a new service that's you know more uh, easier for us to maintain. I mean, all the reasons you make, you don't do monolith. Um, and so, yeah, uh, then we wanted to be cloud native. I know it's a buzzword, but basically it means less stuff we have to manage ourselves and we can rely on the vendor's uh, services. The one thing to mention, the trade-off here is vendor lock-in. And then again, leveraging spot instances. Uh, it's cheaper, way, way, way cheaper. Also, we are storing stuff differently. The, the output is different. So now we have separate audio and video and it's fragmented MP4 outputs. And why we're, we wanted to do this is that it makes the packager jobs m uh, much easier. It can basically take byte ranges, and that makes a chunk. It's a lot easier. Um, you could also save somehow on uh, storage costs, because instead of having the audio mux into every video rendition, you don't have the audio only once, so you know, some storage is saved there. The trade-off is that serving progressive files is a lot more complicated because now you need to first you need to max it and you also need to take what's fragmented and make it progressive. And we'll go over, over this a bit uh, later. We also wanted something that was not written in CoffeeScript and Python 2 and Perl for deployments. So, you know, use Go and the 
turn, basically be able to rely on the standard tooling that Vimeo came up with uh, since 2012. Uh, quickly, a uh, high level overview. So there's two steps for transcode. Uh, again, this is very high level. First, you want to analyze the video. So what it, how it works is that the client sends, uh, talks to the video API, say, hey, I've got this video, uh, I've got these profile sets, uh, you know, please transcode it. The video API will create an analysis job, uh, ask the Falco API to create an analysis job. Falco API will, you know, do its stuff internally, or an analysis worker will pick it up, analyze the video, uh, so analyze that source file, save the index and, and close storage. This will be useful later on when we want to chunk that video to know where we can actually chunk the video. Uh, it will also return some metadata. So typically, uh, I mean, the basics like what's the, you know, height, width, frame rate, is it HDR, uh, all that kind of stuff that will inform later on uh, how, you know, what renditions we want for a video. So that kind of bubbles back to the video, video API, which will get that video, uh, that metadata and make some decisions. And, and that's it for analysis. The next step is video transcoding. I hope it's readable. Um, so the idea is the video API, based on that metadata from the first step, will decide uh, what renditions should, uh, what output we should have. Uh, that's so that's based on metadata and the profile sets. So typically, if you have a 720p video, you, I mean, we don't want at least to make a 1080p video out of it. So this kind of stuff. Also, like if it's not HDR, don't make HDR renditions and, and that kind of stuff. And then. So for each of those outputs that the video API decided, we tell Falcor API, hey, make a video transcode. And so what does that mean? Is that the Falcor API will take the ind indices that we made at the previous step, know where to chunk the video. And then for each of those chunks, uh, we decided on one minute segments uh, for various reasons. And uh, come talk to me about it later. And for each of those segments, make uh, a task that will be transcoded. So then the worker get that one minute chunk. Uh, I mean, it gets the source, a URL to the source file and which bytes from that source file should be taking. So it downloads this, uh, transcodes it, uh, upload to cloud storage, then can for each chunk this happens. At the end of the, uh, not the end of the day hopefully, but <laughs> at the end of all chunks, the uh, Falco API knows, hey, everything has been transcoded. Now is the time to do this uh, concatenation. So what we'll do is that we'll have all those chunks. Uh, we'll also add some metadata at the beginning, concatenate everything. Uh, for in our case, it's easy because our cloud provider offers an API. We can just tell it, hey, concatenate all those objects together. So pretty easy. And then so the, and then it's done. Uh, Falco API, hey, now that video that rendition is done, goes back to the API. It's like, hey, that video is done. There's also some metadata about the video that we store, and then goes back to the client. And then the client knows, OK, well, then that transition is done. Can make some choices about it. And then that's it. All right. Quick note about quick set. Quick set is Vimeo's job scheduler. And it allows us to do two things to help keep the cost down. The first thing is kind of optimize how many tasks are happening on each worker. So you know the pods, the community pods do as much work as possible uh, so we don't waste CPU and memory. And then another thing that uh, has been very helpful in keeping the cost down is that he can take a list of priorities uh, of, uh, sorry, a priority list of uh, nodes. Uh, so, sorry, in Kubernetes, basically a, a list of VMs. Uh, of, sorry, yeah, a list of VMs to know how to scale those different VMs. So, for example, we know that uh, latest generations uh, of CPU works better for transcoding. So it will try to get those latest generation first uh, as much as possible. And if it can't get the latest generation, it can maybe try with the previous version. Because typically, um, there's no guarantee you will get a spot instances. Like the, the cloud provider doesn't guarantee you anything. So the idea is that grab, try to grab as many as you can. But if you cannot, if the provider doesn't give you anything, well, then fall back. And then all the way down, it's like, OK, well, try basically like spot, latest generation, and like spot, non-latest generation, all the way to just whatever is left. And how did we roll it out? So you can see initial commits. I think it's like October 2019. And we're here. 
uh, October 24, 23. Um, started at zero. Now we're at about 96, 97% of our, so it's, it's still not done after two years. And I kind of want to talk about, you know, why. Uh, basically, yeah, so development started in 2020, uh, worked well, and then we, that, we had the release ready for stuff. So basically something that's like just in, internal for Vimeo in production, but only enabled for Vimeo, uh, you know, employees. And that was like in May-ish 2020. And what happened is that at the time, Vimeo Live grew exponentially. And so, well, we had to take engineering resources to Vimeo Live. So then because of COVID. And then, so nothing happens for six months. Great. Um, then finally, stuff settles down a bit with Vimeo Live, and we have time to, you know, work on it again. And then we start the rollout for everybody. I think like the week everybody returns from the, the winter break. So like January 8th, 2021. And then we start like a 240p. Uh, why 240p? It's mostly because it was, it's a rendition that's like not exposed. It's not something you can download. It's not something uh, that's exposed in the API. It's also something like not very many people watch. So if we break it or if it's not available, it's not a big deal. Like it's a blob of pixels and kind of whatever. Uh, <laughs> but it allowed us to kind of put traffic on this new system and to you know, see if it scales and also you know, start to warm it up. Like if you start with like HEVC 1080p, uh, it's gonna, that's maybe not a great idea. So basically 240p and we knew, you know, we could do it without impacting customers and we, you know, at have time to, to scale up and, and all of that. So that took about three months uh, from January to March-ish uh, 2021. We saw, you know, going from zero to 1% was all right, but then 1% to 10%, like that's when you start seeing some issues and all the way up, so it's like, um, they were like a back and forth of like, hey, let's try 10%, so it behaves, okay, well, it's going fine or it's not going fine, can I go back and, and all of that. Uh, then quickly after that, we put Opus in, uh, it was pretty easy, just yep, get audio in there. And then nothing happens release-wise until like 2022. Uh, March-ish 2022, so basically for a year, nothing at, uh, happens. Uh, so what was actually happening behind the scene? Uh, what was happening behind the scene is that we were paying off tech debt. Uh, mostly, we had to build this uh, pipeline to be able to take uh, fragmented MP4, uh, so not max fragmented MP4, and to make it, uh, you know, uh, be able to offer it for downloads because 40p was not available for downloads, but like 10p, we want people to be able to download 10p videos. Like you don't want them to give them like, hey, is an audio file, is a video file, and you know, do something with it. So we had to build this pipeline. Um, we had to, there were times where the new, uh, uh, the new platform was more expensive than the old one because of some scaling issues or whatever and bugs and stuff. So they were like, okay, well, eh, another way to fix that we had to integrate with the Vimeo Monolith, which was making assumptions about uh, format of the transcoded files and that, all that kind of stuff that, because it's been used for over 10 years, it's like, yeah, well, that's how, how it always worked and this is how it's gonna work. But it's like, oh, well, we need to remove all those assumptions to work with the new platform. And that took us some time. And then finally, finally, IAC happened. And by, and by having AAC, it meant that we could uh, we could use this new downloading, uh, this new like progressive file uh, creation generator service called Artax. And uh, yeah, so and then what we did after was uh, 1080p. So why 1080p? 1080p is because it's the most viewed um, rendition we have on the platform in our player. It's also where we would see quality issues. Uh, if there are like if there were great issues in 240p, it's kind of harder to see than than 1080p. So we decided to put uh, 1080p next, and then quickly followed by the rest of the kind of H.264 pipeline uh, ladder, except 360p. Um, 360p. Uh, so that came like what three four months later. 360p was special in Vimeo's case because when 360p was done, it that was that. It's what decided when a video was ready to be played. 
and it's something we didn't want to do anymore. Like with everything happening in parallel, there's no need to wait for 360p because previously 360p was the one that would realistically be done, in, uh, be done first because it was kind of the lowest quality. Uh, now with everything, everything in parallel, it's possible like 720p might be done before, uh, kind of who knows. Uh, so we wanted to have a better system to be, hey, now when kind of any H6.4 is ready and you've got audio, well, you know, you're ready to play back for playback. But a lot, same thing with the tech depth, a lot of things were relying on checking if, you know, 360p was done to decide something that was, was playable. So that was something that, uh, you know, more tech depth. What else? Also, all during this, you've got videos that are transcoded where some editions are on Filecore, some editions are on Tron, and we have no, and like Tron is kind of governed on the video, uh, the PHP monolith, uh, Filecore is governed on this video API, and you have no easy way to know when everything is done because it's kind of in two completely different systems. So we can also have to build something that was like, hey, when is the video really done? Like, are we actually, you know, good to go? So that took some time. And then 360p is done, HDR is kind of easy. Uh, special uh, also goes. So here, you know, the, the line goes up and up and up. And then, yeah, kind of nothing happens again for four, six months, something like that, uh, until VFR happens and it's kind of like the, the last jump. Uh, and so what happened here is that uh, it's kind of the realities of working at the companies like we, when we get, to 360p, almost everything is on it. That's where we got almost all the savings. And then you have to compete with other priorities. You've got other projects that might save you more money than whatever 10-ish percent were remaining. Or you've got other projects that, you know, product really wants. And so that's where, yeah, there's like a lot of like, eh, we had to shift, uh, you know, engineering resources for the stuff. And then we finally were able to come back to VFR. And then also finally had time to, to, do, to do AV1. So yeah, that's, uh, that's why it's taking so long. That's why it's still like 3%, not there yet. Uh, what's not on Filecore are the files that we, not do, that we cannot chunk. Uh, and for those, we'll have to kind of fall back to doing the whole video at once. And that means being able to have, uh, you know, disks. And this means we need to, you know, scale based on disk space and all of that. And that's like, it's non-trivial. It's doable, non-trivial. But again, now we need to compete you no, know, there's like, we need to do it, but it's, it's significant engineering time. We want to make sure it's prioritized um, so we can actually do it because we all want to get rid of Tron. But at the same time, we have to be realistic that uh, the, because there's not that much uh, dollar value attached to, to this, uh, we'll have to, you know, push for it to make sure it happens. Uh, results, it's going to be very high level because I can't talk too much about it. Uh, but it's cheaper, it's faster, so that's nice. Uh, there's a lot of like knobs we can tweak uh, to make it either cheaper or faster, but it's, it's a, it's a trade-off. Uh, in terms of speed, there is some overhead with the new architecture, as everything when it's distributed systems, there's like queues and stuff, and stuff that might go wrong. So there's a bit more overhead. So like short videos can take as long or a bit longer than in improved pipeline, but like for longer videos, you really see the effect of doing it in, in parallel. Quickly, uh, so this is a short version of um, a talk. Uh, I gave it in French at the Paris Video Tech. It's, much, it's twice the size and also more uh, technical. So if you speak French, I recommend it. There's also a blog post. Uh, oh yeah, and shout out to the Paris Video Tech. I would not be here without them. And then there's a, also a very technical blog post by my colleague Derek about this like formatted to progressive uh, MP4 uh, pipeline. And one funny thing is this is kind of all built on open source, both uh, video uh, components and uh, infrastructure stuff. So if you have time, please contribute. If you don't have time, please have, as, uh, have your company send money <laughs> uh, or send patches or, you know, just update documentation, whatever, uh, all of that. And that's it. Mm -hmm.